Um, yeah, today I've been asked to talk about the front three and the rules. And um, for me, that's something I, I I love to talk about just because simply I was a forward um, in my playing career and it's something that I think is really valuable these days in terms of like the know-how between attack and defence and the general kind of the overall picture and why, why managers pick certain players. Um, they're very hard to come by these days, these kind of attackers. And um, for me, I believe... Um, the front three, especially as two inside forwards and a false nine, is probably the most consistent right now. And it has been probably since um, the likes of Barcelona really um, put the stamp on that and the high press. So and that's what we'll get into today and talk about a wee bit. And then again, if there's anybody who wants to ask questions or uh, leave it at the end, ask a few questions, no problem at all. And again, football's so subjective, as we all know. So what I might think about something is a entirely my own opinion but maybe I've seen it somewhere that's worked but you know the old 442 or 451 or a long ball might just be as effective and might get you a goal somewhere along the line so why I'm talking about the front three and the rules is simply because I believe this is the most consistent um, for the front three in terms of how they're attacking and the philosophy going forward so um, number one a, I'll go into it just to understand the rules players these days individually and collectively when the press, timing, the movement, teamwork, offensive and defensive, as I said, and being ruthless in front of goal, you don't want to ever get away from that. That is their job, number one. That's usually where these players are, you know, you know, they're marked on as a young kid as well coming through. Everyone says goal scorer, this goal scorer, that. But I think we all know that they bring so much more than goal scoring, but that is definitely important for that too. So a few slides that have done and again open to interpretation and this is my understanding of the game and for me i've worked with um, three international managers and they've all had uh, their own style so i want to bring my own style onto things first and foremost but i believe from just watching good football on tv and um, you familiarize yourself with certain um formations and, and for me this is probably one of the best so as we go into it here we have the four three three one four three three so you can see I'm set up with a goalkeeper four and a three and a three up front. And you can see I've just put in the number nine, dropping a wee bit deeper just to show you a false nine. So players number seven, nine, 11, that's what we're going to be focusing on. So this is shape, as I told you, but in the modern day game, that's what usually we have. The top teams playing with a false nine and two inside forwards. That's a starting position. Midfield and fullbacks look to support and attack. The player will need to defend, can quickly see the two inside forwards drop back into five-man midfield if necessary. So formations change as the play goes along. You know, the two wide men effectively as front three, but they can drop. That's part and parcel of the modern-day game, and you've got to be tuned into that. Players must, must, must be aware of that once they're playing football and, and jump quickly into a defensive formation if needed. Um, so if they get the press right from the front, then they'll be able to maintain their high line and press and cause a threat to the other team, making it much harder to get out of their own half. And you see that nowadays. And obviously I said Barcelona in the very, very beginning. And I think whenever Pep Guardiola was there years ago, he was the one that really maybe brought that team to the next level. And whilst they might not be the same Barcelona team now, they dominated for 10 years and set a blueprint basically for other teams to maybe develop that high press um, and being ruthless, getting the ball back and winning the ball back as quickly as they can to set themselves off in a place to try and score or attack as quickly as possible. So moving on to central striker and inside forwards in possession. So we'll first talk about the false number nine. The false nine, who many of us might probably straight away think of the likes of Firmino, is probably the best one to talk about. So Firmino, for me, or a false nine, is a huge part of the styles to play to help better the attacking areas, dominate possession, as well as being able to play a huge part in counter-attacks. The number nine usually possesses high technical ability, the drop in between the defence and midfield opposition, and that usually just causes a wee bit of uncertainty, really. And um, Players don't know whether to go or come with them, and they're always looking over the shoulder. Um, and it creates openings for teammates, whilst being a goal-scoring threat also. Work rate, movement, ability to exploit the opposition are key. The number nine has good link-up play and understands fully the role he plays with the team to enhance openings for himself and his two attacking forwards. 
With the number nine dropping into the holes, it creates confusion for the opposition, keeping them thinking with the defence in midfield, unsure how to pick them up. And we've seen many a times, probably over the last few years as well, the false number nine, maybe if he's not getting the goals, he's probably not getting as much credit. But until you actually dissect the game, so to speak, or go back and watch the videos or the clips, it usually comes from that kind of starting position. And that's really the template for the rest of the team to build off. If they've got that false number nine who can drop in and create a bit of uncertainty for the opposition, then it allows other players with good movement and timing to then, you know, interact with each other and win the ball back or just get through balls or keep possession in a nice area. So as we move on, here you can see I have a few little illustrations. So in this picture, we see the number nine dropping deep. So I have it as a triangle here. That's effectively a good little position for him. And you can see the seven and 11 either side of him. So he'll try and operate the number nine pretty much, pretty much in that kind of triangle would be what you'd like to see. Um, Barn runs down the side the odd time, but we'll get into that as well. So they'll look to create space. They'll come short and drag a defender out with them if possible. If that's what happened, it lets the forwards make runs from outside to in. You can see the 7-11, and that will be a trigger. So that is the trigger for a wide forward to make a movement as soon as the number nine drops deep. If the defender goes to the nine, then there is a weakness in defense to exploit. If a defender doesn't come out with a number nine, then he's in a great position to get on the ball with space to attack and be creative. The number nine may look to dribble or keep possession or look for three balls or carving out an opportunity for himself. Speed of play is extremely important as it can help to lead to a goal scoring opportunity as players are having to change its shape to defend. It is a great tactic to have a false number nine and the team will benefit from having an overloading attack and pressing to win the ball high up. And I've shown this illustration, players number 711 making the runs inside to the space, which also leaves space on the outside for our fullbacks to attack. The modern day fullbacks are extremely important when there's space to occupy an attack. So if you just want to have a quick look at that illustration, the triangle obviously being the predominantly where the number nine is going to be, trying to look for the ball, but he's surrounded then, obviously, knowing if he comes short, he's got the 7-11 that are going to make those inside runs. You've got the 10, who will be supporting. The 8 will be supporting. Players number 3 and 2, for sake of argument, Robertson and Trent Alexander. In the modern day, you'll have players number four and players number five squeezing up towards the halfway line and then you'll have the six just sitting in a nice little position to affect play if, if you know it's nice and narrow um and there already you can see the player number nine comes in there's going to be space on the outside for the wing backs it can play a through ball to the 11 it can play a through ball to the seven that's a nice little operation in there so moving on to the next slide so another illustration so I'm highlighting this as the inside forward player 11 has moved inside, creating space for the fullback to attack. Immediately, player 11 runs towards the goal in the area highlighted, position one. So I've highlighted position one, two, and three inside the 18 box. That's kind of predominantly where those players would try and look to make the runs. Maybe the number nine might hang out. Or if he pushes right in towards the six yard box, you'll have maybe the 10 kind of getting into the area. So I would like to think you'll have four or five players and the top level teams get into the box whenever they're in a position like that. Um, so as I say, highlight position one, it looks for a chance to score or the rebound. Player nine gets into the top of the triangle. So he's still in that position that I've highlighted from the start. Also looking to get numbers in the box and score. Player seven will be attacking the mid to back post. And also if the ball is overhit, he's in a great position to try and react and retrieve the ball. And you see that quite a lot, even at the um, schoolboy level, that's what they try and coach. It's making sure the ball's never dead, the ball, their second wave, wave after wave. That's something that was always drilled into me. And I like to see players making that back run post. You know, if it's over hit, they're not being selfish. You know, they're being good team players. They're filling the areas that they need to. Number one, getting across the front post. Number two, being in a position for a rebound or a poaching assist or goal number seven being there for the overhead ball or you know that ball that was maybe meant for him at the back post who could maybe flick it back have a shot and go or whatever so as you see and as a highlight as well player number two who would be our fullback in a brilliant position occupies that space just coming in behind as well 
to link up play if play gets broken down or he's in a position to defend. But he can only be in that position because of the front three making those great runs. And that's the thing about the team play. You know, you, we're talking about the number two here, but it's only because the number 11, number nine, number seven occupy these great high areas and are trying to penetrate. That's why the other team can push up and stay as narrow as that and maybe try and win the ball back as quickly as possible. So that would keep the ball alive, regeneration of play, or himself crossing the ball back in, or maybe even shooting. We have a number of players overloading the final third and causing the defending team some panic, okay, and uncertainty in their 18-yard box. Okay, the defensive teams won't want as many players as that bombing forward, and you know, in the modern day game, it just puts the opposition on the defense, it just keeps them pinned in a little bit, maybe. And if there's a high pressing team against them, it does put uncertainty in them too. So players number eight and ten, just quickly as well, are, are very close to the play as well. And they try and effectively keep possession or create chances, or again, if the play is broken down or wave after wave, regenerating the play. But they're always in a fantastic position to win play back and are supporting the front three who have made those good runs. Players six, four, and five are narrow, forcing play wide, if possible, allowing time for our team to get back and defend if need be. And as I say, like I mentioned before, if we win the play back, because our high press from our front three as well are already in a good position, then our shape is set up immediately to counter. Okay, so now we'll talk about the inside forwards slightly more. So inside forwards, again, as I said, they're massive. Uh, they're a massive factor in the team playing well, or even when they aren't playing well, like we all know, they're still a constant threat. And they have the players that can change the game in an instant. They also possess the ability to pressurize the opposition high up the pitch, being backed by a solid midfield and defense. The inside forwards understand the rules and work together as a front three with quality and high work rate. They're responsible for scoring and creating chances. A high work rate is imperative to win the ball back out of possession. And this is usually high up the pitch to regain possession quicker and are in turn closer to the opposition goal. The inside forwards can play in all front three positions and switch during the game to keep defenders guessing and pinning them back, not allowing them to progress up the field. The forwards make clever runs, dribble at the opposition and fill the penalty box on attacks. The front three occupy the opposition's back line of defence, be usually a back four, and they pin them back as well. So just looking at the illustration here, if you just want to take a quick look at the illustration, just and then I'll talk about it in a second. So I have the inside forward making the movement and the runs. Number 11. I've selected the number seven moving inside with the ball, as you can see. And that is a trigger for the number nine to stay high and occupy the two central defenders. If the left back vacated his position, then, sorry, if the left back vacated his position to press in their space, as you can see there, and the number nine would probably make that run in there as well. I also have the number 11 on the opposite flank starting wide, but makes that dynamic run inside and worries defenders. And again, a vacated position, leaving space for our left wing back to run into. So good team play again from the front three, one going short, one running behind, one cutting inside narrow, creating space, creating an overload. Again, if that doesn't work out, they're in a position just to keep the ball, pass and move, regenerate and go from side to side, as you usually see from top teams. And they're very patient until the openings are there. So player two has space to run into and support play as number seven has run inside. Okay, Players need to understand each other and triggers and when to move and create space. So that is a trigger point. As soon as the number seven has run inside and taken it in, you know, the player six might come towards him, the player four might come towards him, the player three might come towards him. If there's a little bit of uncertainty, then that's when the other players capitalize. And with good movement at speed, teams will get in and create chances. And that's usually what front three do, they wait and get their timing. So defenders don't like players running at them as it keeps them pinned back. And as soon as that happens, they might stay deep creating more space in front of them to possess the ball. So for the likes of the number nine, he might get on the ball a little bit more um, than he thought he might. So you can see the back line is pushed up, supporting the player on the ball and making supporting runs on the outside, number three, the number two, number six pushing up, number 10, and again, number nine has got a choice of a couple of runs there. If that's done a pace, then we can get a lot of success 
it may also lead to the opposition being more cautious. Bring players back or change your system forces players to get narrow. And just on that, if anybody watched the Champions League last night, um, you had Juventus playing against uh, 6-3-2. Or six three one at one point, sorry, beg your pardon, with the goalkeeper as well. So um it was a fascinating to watch that and to see how condensed they were. Um they were trying to force them wide. And on the plus side of that, then you had Juventus trying to cross the ball in loads to their forward. So it was a different kind of a front three. Um, as I say, it wasn't as fluid as, as the front three of the inside forwards making their moves, but it was a change of shape that created that from the first leg to that leg. So um, you could see the forwards had to try and come up with something different. So the front three here in this illustration <clears throat> with full backs occupying wide positions. So with top teams, you see this a lot as the inside forwards are smart, finding the inside pockets of space, but also freeing up space for the full backs to run into. This works for very technical teams who dominate possession. We have eight players narrow and two wide players keeping good shape. This allows a wide player to be an option and get in the ball or the team can play those great passes between lines and immediately set the team on good attacking play. Players have the ability to interchange and rotate, but if they lose the ball, an immediate press is necessary. We can outnumber the opposition by tweaking our shape and forwards making clever runs or dropping deep before going long, mixing things up. The good thing about most top teams is they have a number of threats to score, not relying on any individual, and they're all creating and contributing. So as I said there, most teams, good teams, have goals coming from everywhere. So that's the thing, you know, it's not, not so many... Yes, I'm sure certain players will be selfish and want to score and have records and stuff, but that will come because of good team play. And you see the unselfish players who are the best, you know, they've got <clears throat> in that diagram players number two and three, high and wide, you know, they're trying to assist as much as they can. Players nine, 11 and seven will predominantly be the ones causing the real threat in the final third. But then you've goals coming from everywhere. And again, touching on it quickly, the number nine, 10 and seven will probably win a lot of free kicks, a lot of set pieces because they're playing at speed and with good movement. The opposition will get frustrated. You know, it happens, especially in foreign leagues as well, or Champions League, you get players, you know, trying to take players out or taking a yellow card for the team, disrupting the rhythm of the team. But again, with players with technical ability and great quality, they're still going to be a threat. And they're, that's a good play, winning set pieces high up the pitch as well. Okay, so just moving on to our next slide. Again, so you can see, I've just done a little... Um, box kind of thing in the middle. I've shown an illustration of my two inside forwards, numbers 11 and seven that are narrow now. And you can see automatically that would all, uh, narrow the opposition on their back line. So their back line, and I've seen this in many games, once the ninth or the seven and 11 with their number nine can come into a little triangle shape, it automatically just makes the defense come in nice and narrow. Still good play from the opposition team to be there in a place to force players wide and they can frustrate the, the, their opposition as well. But again, it's a, it's a, once you're not the dominating team, it's quite a hard thing to do. But with the good movement of our front three, it allows our full backs to stay high and wide. And if they're pressed, then there's space for our forwards to run into. So again, you see the 9, 11, and 7, all in small, pro close proximity. The number two, high and wide, can cause problems down to our left back. If the two goes to the blue, number three, for example, the number nine could make that run down the line. The number 11 could make that run from deep. Number seven, getting in to support that. Again, on the opposite side, pretty much the same. Okay, so it's a good balance that the blue team have here. They can pivot, they can come out around and play. But again, players will try and frustrate the opposition because they've got more than just one dimension. They can go wide, they can come narrow. Okay, so they're very good at what to do. Movement's intricate. Um, and a, a, a lot of communication. This will be something they do in the training ground daily. So this has just become second nature to them. And as I said, our forwards might not even get on the ball here, but because that they're in a narrow shape and there's numbers around them, it might narrow the opposition. Good play from the forwards, smart play and unselfish. And it takes smart players to perform that, in my opinion. Okay, so this illustration just quickly shows the attack in front three setting up from an opposition goal kick. So a lot of 
forwards might get just you know recognized for their goals and people look at that but when you really dive in deeper it's so much more and they're trying to disrupt the rhythm of the opposition even from a, a place of a restart so here's a bye ball and the goalkeeper's trying to play out and we have a front three trying to occupy four unless you're really comfortable in getting the ball it's a difficult thing to do and unless you're really comfortable in your technical players around you as well the formation of the system the manager gives you and you know you're against the high pressing team it is always very difficult but it's one thing saying that the blue team in this have to press have to really make it hard for the opposition to play out or else it doesn't work so you see them here in an advanced position the players occupy the back four and make the opposition think twice about playing out from the back. If they choose to do so, they will know how important each pass is to make. Otherwise, the attacking team's ability to press up high will cause uncertainty and a danger to them. With the attacking team pressing high, other teams have tried to play over the front three to an attacking midfielder of their own, or even kick long, high or wide as the opponent's team will be pushed up. This is the weakness of a high press, leaving space in behind for quick players to attack. Although this is a weakness, the team pressing high will have confidence in their teammates and manager style. This will be something they work on in training and are used to their, their success. So it won't change much even if someone exploits your weakness. Now, I've seen this quite a lot. And um, again, the top teams, high press, brilliant. But I remember playing a game um, for myself and it was in the, the Europa League many years ago now. It was actually against Juventus and they had a they played over the top of midfield and it was a chipped pass. Now, it was very tactical from their point of thing. And um, what they tried to do was hit Amari on just because he was a big target man and then turn and get players going from the turn in the midfield. Now, that, that's changed a little bit now, but that's still what I'm trying to say is that is a weakness of a high press. There is space in behind if it goes wrong for the high pressing team. And if the red team in this situation can figure a way out past the Blues. Moving on, another example just I've shown in the illustration, you can see here that the blue team are trying to show, so starting from the front three, they're trying to put the red team into an area they want them to play into. And that comes from good play from the, the blue team. So another example of pressing high from a front three, this time the opposition looked to play out from the back. But as a team, that press is high. We can set triggers, make it hard for our opponents to play out effectively. If you look at the illustration, which have the 11, the 9, and the 7 going in. Our forwards are making it predictable by forcing the opposition to play to one side. You can see that the left back is on to play out, the number three in the reds. As soon as play gets passed, the players sprint and close down space and opposition immediately, trying to win playback as high up the field, starting on an attack if possible. We don't want to give our opponents a chance to possess the ball or get into our half of the pitch easily. We want to force the opposition to give the ball back quickly or run out of ideas or play the long ball. The angle of runs we make when pressing fast closes off the switch of play and our team is well set up behind our front three if play goes past them. So if you just want to have a look at that illustration of the ball with the goalkeeper, quite simply, the 11 would close down the four. Perhaps the number nine is going to sprint towards the number five. That's just in my illustration, it's going to the number three. So the player will be going out to number three. You've got the seven going as quickly as possible. You can see the two, four, and five, and the three all trying to go one side as well. If the number seven on the opposite hand stays there, the number three has to play an unbelievable ball across the pitch. I would fancy any of our players to have that switch of play. If someone said to me, you're going to cross the ball 60 really yards across the field, it's not so much of an issue. So as long as we stay together as a team, that's what I like to see. The play can be won back quickly. If there's a mistake from the red team, we're in a good place to win it back. We've high numbers going forward and we'll look to try and get on the counter attack straight away or try and set up a chance for our team. Okay, here's another one. Our picture shows the opposition centre backs going deep to play it from the back this time. So maybe they are trying to play a little bit more football out from the back and they're confident. So you have the player four and the five inside the box, players two and three, nice and high and wide. Again, there's a disciplined high press and an overload in the middle area highlighted. But this, again, always comes from our front three. So as you can see, it doesn't matter where in the pitch, the front three are always working. And it's not just we're talking about goals here. We're talking about setting a template, setting a blueprint for the rest of the team, how to start, how to win the ball back. Play starts from the front of the field. And that's how 
football is consistently achieved results play starts from the top of the front men so we've set a disciplined high press and an overload in the middle high area in the middle area highlighted okay we have our number nine ready to fast press and run towards the goalkeeper closing off the switch and forcing play one way with the number seven moving in centrally for any breakdown and able to counter the number 11 is in a position to press aggressively. If play can't be won back and the opposition play through the lines, our forwards are able to sprint back behind the opposition player to make them make a difficult pass by rushing them. So when the forwards are running back, it looks like a 4-5-1 sometimes, but this is a good team. Team play eliminating space to regain possession and counter. This is set up well because the rest of the team are in great positions and understand each other's roles. Okay, so you can see in that kind of blanket of midfield as well of the blue players. So you've one, two, three, four, five, six players against four reds in the kind of central area. The number two, nice and high and wide on the red. Seven, eleven, wide as well. Not really causing too much of a, a panic here. And it's good positional play from the number 11. It goes kind of in between the two and the four. The number nine, ready to press the five and close off the switch. And number seven can come inside, as I said, and the team will just kind of like smaller them as much as possible. Highlighted the strengths and weaknesses, in my opinion, for this. So the strengths are the high press, which is so effective. It occupies many defenders. Goes from the transition, transition to counter when needed. Movement and interplay. Speed of play, which we've talked about, and leads to more opportunities. You're already in an attacking position, so why not go after the defence if you believe you're good enough and put the defence under a lot, a lot of pressure? But the weaknesses, as I said, always are some space over the top of the high line, fatigue potentially over over the long period of the game. But again, that's when you want the substitutes to come in. Um, if pressure is in the immediate, players and teams can play through you or keep possession. So it has to be immediate. If you're all going to do it, you have to do it together. And if you don't do it, you have got to drop off and do it. You know, at certain times, the team have to know exactly when to do it and why to do it. Um, you don't want any big gaps between defence. Again, if you don't press, there could be gaps opening up. If one goes and the next man doesn't go, it's just disorientated. It just it doesn't work. Okay, so that's between the midfield and forward to get that right balance. Showing the shape from our goal kick, again, you have our front three are so important to even restarting from our own play. And this day and age it's imperative that the front three stretch the play as much as possible if you're a ball if you're a team that wants to play out from the back you'll have technical players that can find the front three pretty quick but they're occupying the defense keeping them pinned back and they're very dangerous so our front three are set up even from their own goal kicks in fact their whole team spread out as you can see high and wide both vertically and horizontally our forwards are pinning the defenders and because our full backs are wide, this unsettles the opposition team and where exactly they should press. Even with the options of a short goal kick or playing to either full back or the deep line midfielder, we always have the outlet of going longer and more direct if need be, as we possess great power and strength going forward. And we can back this up as we have numbers around our forwards. Okay, one key to this is because top teams will tend to have goalkeepers with great distribution who can play short and long when needed. Having these options are crucial in the modern game. And as you can see, the, if the ball was to go long to the number 11, you have a little triangle there already between either the number three or the eight or the eight and the nine. Again, on the opposite side, you have a triangle between the number nine, 10 and seven, or the seven, 10 and two. Equally, that's just us being in a good position. No one were good on the ball, able to find these players nice and quick and start an attack. Okay, so here we have the red team, goal kick showing team shape. Team spread out high and wide, opposition locked on, but if the red team get their play right, they can break the blue team's lines. It's a high risk and reward, like we spoke about, but worth it when you get it right, and it's a fantastic way to restart the game from a goal kick. Defence and midfield can look to restart play because of the three forwards staying further up the field and they're disciplined. So a lot of it, again, comes down to the front three, Staying disciplined, knowing the rules, knowing their self as team play. And once that happens, once they do that and the opposition know they're good at it, they'll start to 
come back a little bit further. And then it just lets play go through the lines. And because of the game, because of the front three being that, that good and disciplined, it helps them out a lot. Blue team set up here. So as the goalkeeper plays the ball to the left center half, the whole blue team start to close off space in areas with a fast high press. Can the red team play fast possession and look for spaces to capitalize on? Again, comes from the front three, maintain high line and width. And this came from a game that actually Red Bull Leipzig played against Liverpool. And I'll just quickly talk about the, this is how they set up the Reds were actually Liverpool in this scenario. Blues were Leipzig and two players centre halves with the 18, players three and two, width of the pitch, 11, nine, seven, not interested in the ball, staying hand wide, allowing that space. And Leipzig, who are a brilliant team and a very good chance against Liverpool in the next leg, couldn't figure out this little um, setup from the back. And um, as I said, the Reds moved to create space and open after a hard press in the front. And they actually got out quite a lot from this. Um, and as you can see in the next one, this is actually how they got out. So as the red team play the ball to the left center half, they then place the left back who draws a number two towards him. If this is done well at speed, then the space vacated by the blue number two can be filled by a late run from red team number six highlighted. Okay, this puts our team in a wide position, shifting the whole blue team to one side of the pitch. If play can be kept and good movement off the ball, then there will be space on the opposite side of the field where the red team can take advantage. Attackers are already on the front foot looking for wins. So this is all about basically trying to build up to give our forwards more opportunity on the ball, more possession, dominate, to be, be more consistent. And as I said, if you look at the, the yellow four zones I've highlighted, the play came to the number three. The number two had to go. If he's going to press, he has to go. So that opened a little opening for the number 11 to get into. Does the four go with him? He has an option to make. Does the six go with him? In one scenario, the player three had the ball. The number six made the run in behind the blue number two. And the number 11 went on behind. So there's loads of different scenarios and movements. And it's just trying to shift players out of position to unlock the final third. And that's all that is. That's kind of just the 11, the nine, and the seven are trying to occupy the back four or three or whoever it is and try and just keep them pinned back, allowing the more or the other technical players on their team to create more space and more openings. And it was it was unbelievable to actually watch this game time and time again. The the um playing out from the back just worked a treat and it was brilliant to see. And they uh, on on some occasions Leipzig did not have a, an answer for it. But um I'm not I want to show you a little a uh, video if possible. It'll not come up on my laptop because there was a technical issue. So just to quickly to show you, I'll be able to show you it on my on my iPad real quickly. So I'm just going to turn it around for you so you can so you can see just because it's fascinating what we talked about and it, it ends with the 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 striker. So if anybody saw um Burnley against Arsenal last week, this was what happened. So I'm just going to show you this so you can have a, a, a little look. Again, apologies, it's not on the on the computer just because there was a technical issue first. So you can see the goalkeeper playing out from the back. And the pressing, in my opinion, is terrible. But great play from Arsenal. Quickly break through the, through the lines. A little bit of indecision from the opposition. And it ends with a goal. And again, I could, if, if it was on the computer, it'd be easier to show you, but there's so many, so many problems with not pressing high or disjointed from the, the front two. The front two went there. One went half in the challenge. The other one didn't go. At one point, there was actually Granit Zach in midfield, had four players around him. All of a sudden, it was a little one-two bounce pass. It was played in the William. Six players were taken out of the game. So two passes, six players were taken out of the game, which is... It's terrible, great play from, from the team in possession. And on that, there were three forwards, nice and high and what and centrally. And uh, they patient, just like we spoke about, the back four were in a good position, nice and narrow, no problem. But once that ball was played through the middle and your players run that, you would speed, you have a decision to make. And it's in every game, do I go or do I not? It's that decision. It ended up that 
six players were running back from the opposition and they couldn't deal they couldn't deal with the power and threat. They didn't get into their shape quick enough and it allowed Arsenal to score a brilliantly worked goal. And you see that time and time again, playing from the back. That's just what I've talked about. The front three staying nice and patient. If the opposition aren't going to press you well, you're going to get out time and time again. And just as it's proven there, it just leads to a goal scoring opportunity and a goal. So at that point, I'd like to take any questions from anybody. If you want to put me back on, that'd be great. As I said, that's the attacking and defensive side that forwards have to have to have in their locker these days. It's just it's just a must. Managers, that's what they want. Selfless players who can contribute to the team, attacking and defensively, going inside, going on the outside. As I said, I'm focusing on the inside forwards, so I believe is the most consistent. Um, way to attack these days the most dominant and previously it might have been the, the wingers who you could have played in the front three but you would have been trying to go down the outside around across the ball in again like I spoke about Juventus tried to do that last night but predominantly you want consistency from your team consistency from the front three over the last number of years has been the inside forwards and the false nine coming into play so yeah I'm happy to take any questions or if there's anything you, you'd like to talk about? 